Part Two: A Voyage to Brobdingnag. Chapter Four: The Country Described. Proposal for Correcting Modern Maps. The King's Palace and Some Account of the Metropolis. The Author's Way of Travelling. The Chief Temple Described. I now intend to give the reader a short description of this country, as far as I travelled in it, which was not above two thousand miles round Lobrulgrud, the metropolis. For the queen, whom I always attended, never went farther when she was accompanying the king in his progress, and there stayed till his majesty returned from viewing his frontiers. The whole extent of this prince's dominions reached about six thousand miles in length, and from three to five in breadth. Whence I cannot but conclude that our geographers of Europe are in a great error by supposing nothing but sea between Japan and California. For it was ever my opinion that there must be a balance of earth to counterpose the great continent of Tartary, and therefore they ought to correct their maps and charts by joining this vast tract of land to the northwest parts of America, wherein I shall be ready to lend them my assistance. The kingdom is a peninsula, terminated to the northeast by a ridge of mountains thirty miles high, which are altogether impassable, by reason of the volcanoes upon the tops. Neither do most of the learned know what sort of mortals inhabit beyond those mountains, or whether they be inhabited at all. On the three other sides it is bounded by the ocean. There is not one seaport in the whole kingdom and those parts of the coasts into which the rivers issue are so full of pointed rocks, and the sea generally so rough, that there is no venturing with the smallest of their boats, so that these people are wholly excluded from any commerce with the rest of the world. But the large rivers are full of vessels, and abound with excellent fish, for they seldom get any from the sea because the sea-fish are on the same size with those in Europe, and consequently not worth catching. Whereby it is manifest that nature, in the production of plants and animals of so extraordinary a bulk, is wholly confined to this continent, of which I leave the reasons to be determined by philosophers. However, now and then they take a whale that happens to be dashed against the rocks, which the common people feed on heartily. These whales I have known so large, that a man could hardly carry one upon his shoulders. And sometimes, for curiosity, they are brought in hampers to Lerbrulgrud. I saw one of them in a dish at the king's table, which passed for a rarity, but I did not observe he was fond of it. For I think, indeed, the bigness disgusted him, although I have seen one somewhat larger in Greenland. The country is well inhabited, for it contains fifty-one cities, near a hundred walled towns, and a great number of villages. To satisfy my curious reader, it may be sufficient to describe Lerbrulgrud. This city stands upon almost two equal parts on each side of the river that passes through. It contains above eighty thousand houses, and about six hundred thousand inhabitants. It is, in length, three glomglungs, which make about fifty-four English miles, and two and a half in breadth, as I measured it myself in the royal map made by the king's order, which was laid on the ground on purpose for me, and extended a hundred feet. I paced the diameter and circumference several times barefoot, and computing by the scale, measured it pretty exactly. The king's palace is no regular edifice, but a heap of buildings about seven miles round. The chief rooms are generally two hundred and forty feet high, and broad and long in proportion. The coach was allowed to Glomdalklitch and me, wherein her governess frequently took her out to see the town, or go among the shops. And I was always of the party, carried in my box, although the girl, at my own desire, would often take me out, and hold me in her hand, that I might more conveniently view the houses and the people, as we passed along the streets. 
I reckoned our coach to be about a square of Westminster Hall, but not altogether so high. However, I cannot be very exact. One day the governess ordered our coachman to stop at several shops, where the beggars, watching their opportunity, crowded to the sides of the coach, and gave me the most horrible spectacle that ever a European eye beheld. There was a woman with a cancer in her breast, swelled to a monstrous size, full of holes, in two or three of which I could easily have crept and covered my whole body. There was a fellow with a wen in his neck, larger than five wool-packs, and another with a couple of wooden legs, each about twenty feet high. But the most hateful sight of all was the lice crawling on their clothes. I could see distinctly the limbs of these vermin with my naked eye, much better than those of a European louse through a microscope and their snouts, with which they rooted like swine. They were the first I had ever beheld, and I should have been curious enough to dissect one of them, if I had had proper instruments, which I unluckily left behind me in the ship, although indeed the sight was so nauseous that it perfectly turned my stomach. Besides the large box in which I was usually carried, the Queen ordered a smaller one to be made for me, of about twelve feet square and ten high, for the convenience of travelling, because the other was somewhat too large for Glumdalclitch's lap, and cumbersome in the coach. It was made by the same artist, whom I am directed in the whole contrivance. This travelling closet was an exact square, with a window in the middle of three of the squares, and each window was latticed with iron wire on the outside, to prevent accidents in long journeys. On the fourth side, which had no window, two strong staples were fixed, through which the person that carried me, when I had a mind to be on horseback, put a leathern belt and buckled it about his waist. This was always the office of some grave, trusty servant, in whom I could confide, whether I attended the king and queen in their progresses, or were disposed to see the gardens, or pay a visit to some great lady or minister of state in the court, when Glumdalclitch happened to be out of order. For I soon began to be known and esteemed among the greatest officers, I suppose more upon account of their majesty's favour than any merit of my own. In journeys, when I was weary of the coach, a servant on horseback would buckle on my box, and place it on a cushion before him. And there I had a full prospect of the country on three sides, from my three windows. I had, in this closet, a field-bed and a hammock hung from the ceiling, two chairs and a table neatly screwed to the floor, to prevent being tossed about by the agitation of the horse or the coach. And having been long used to sea voyages, those motions, although sometimes very violent, did not much discompose me. Whenever I had a mind to see the town, it was always in my travelling closet, which Glumdalclitch held in her lap in a kind of open sedan, after the fashion of the country, borne by four men and attended by two others in the Queen's livery. The people, who had often heard of me, were very curious to crowd about the sedan, and the girl was complacent enough to make the bearers stop and take me in her hand, that I might be more conveniently seen. I was very desirous to see the chief temple, and particularly the tower belonging to it, which is reckoned the highest in the kingdom. Accordingly one day my nurse carried me thither, but I may truly say I came back disappointed, for the height is not above three thousand feet, reckoning from the ground to the highest pinnacle top which, allowing for the difference between the size of those people and us in Europe, is no great matter for admiration, nor at all equal in proportion, if I rightly remember, to Salisbury steeple. But not to detract from a nation, to which during my life, I shall acknowledge myself extremely obliged, it must be allowed, that whatever this famous tower wants in height, is amply made up in beauty and strength, for the walls are near a hundred feet thick, built of hewn stone, whereof each is about forty feet square, 
and adorned on all sides with statues of gods and emperors cut in marble, larger than life, placed in several niches. I measured a little finger which had fallen down from one of these statues, and lay unperceived among some rubbish, and found it exactly four feet and an inch in length. Plumdale Clitch wrapped it up in a handkerchief, and carried it home in her pocket, to keep among other trinkets, of which the girl was very fond, as children at her age usually are. The King's Kitchen is indeed a noble building, vaulted at top, and about six hundred feet high. The great oven is not so wide, by ten paces, as a cupola at St. Paul's for I measured the latter on purpose after my return. But if I should describe the kitchen grate, the prodigious pots and kettles, the joints of meat turning on the spits, with many other particulars, perhaps I should be hardly believed. At least a severe critic would be apt to think I enlarged a little, as travellers are often suspected to do. To avoid which censor, I fear I have run too much into the other extreme and that if this treatise should happen to be translated into the language of Brobdingnag, which is the general name of that kingdom, and transmitted thither, the king and his people would have reason to complain that I had done them an injury, by a false and diminutive representation. His majesty seldom keeps above six hundred horses in his stables. They are generally from fifty-four to sixty feet high, but when he goes abroad on solemn days, he is attended, for state, by a military guard of five hundred horses, which indeed I thought was the most splendid sight that could ever be beheld, till I saw part of his army in battle, whereof I shall find another occasion to speak. Part 2. A Voyage to Brobdingnag. Chapter 5. Several adventures that happened to the author the execution of a criminal, the author shows his skill in navigation. I should have lived happily enough in that country, if my littleness had not exposed me to several ridiculous and troublesome accidents, some of which I shall venture to relate. Glumdalclitch often carried me into the gardens of the court in my smaller box, and would sometimes take me out of it and hold me in her hand, or set me down to walk. I remember before the dwarf left the queen, he followed us one day into those gardens, and my nurse, having set me down, he and I being close together, near some dwarf apple-trees, I must needs show my wit, by a silly allusion between him and the trees, which happened to hold in their language as it does in ours. Whereupon the malicious rogue, watching his opportunity, when I was walking under one of them, shook it directly over my head, by which a dozen apples, each of them near as large as a bristol barrel, came tumbling about my ears. One of them hit me on the back as I chanced to stoop, and knocked me down flat on my face. But I received no other hurt, and the dwarf was pardoned at my desire, because I had given the provocation. Another day Glumdalclitch left me on a smooth grass-plot to divert myself, while she walked at some distance with her governess. In the meantime, there suddenly fell such a violent shower of hail that I was immediately by the force of it struck to the ground. And when I was down, the hailstones gave me such cruel bangs all over the body as if I had been pelted with tennis balls. However, I made a shift to creep on all fours and shelter myself by lying flat on my face on the lee side of a border of lemon thyme but so bruised from head to foot that I could not go abroad in ten days. Neither is this at all to be wondered at, because nature, in that country, observing the same proportion through all her operations, a hailstone is near eighteen hundred times as large as one in Europe, which I can assert upon experience, having been so curious as to weigh and measure them. But a more dangerous accident happened to me in the same garden, when my little nurse, believing she had put me in a secure place, which I often entreated her to do, that I might enjoy my own thoughts, and having left my box at home, to avoid the trouble of carrying it, went to another part of the garden with her governess, and some ladies of her acquaintance. 
while she was absent and out of hearing, a small white spaniel that belonged to one of the chief gardeners, having got by accident into the garden, happened to range near the place where I lay. The dog, following the scent, came directly up, and taking me in his mouth ran straight to his master wagging his tail, and set me gently on the ground. By good fortune he had been so well taught that I was carried between his teeth without the least hurt, or even tearing my clothes. But the poor gardener, who knew me well, and had a great kindness for me, was in a terrible fright. He gently took me up in both hands, and asked me how I did. But I was so amazed and out of breath that I could not speak a word. In a few minutes I came to myself, and he carried me safe to my little nurse, who, by this time, had returned to the place where she left me, and was in cruel agonies when I did not appear, nor answer when she called. She severely reprimanded the gardener on account of his dog. But the thing was hushed up, and never known at court, for the girl was afraid of the Queen's anger. And truly, as to myself, I thought it would not be for my reputation that such a story should go about. This accident absolutely determined Glumdalclitch never to trust me abroad, for the future out of her sight. I had been long afraid of this resolution, and therefore concealed from her some little unlucky adventures, that happened in those times while I was left by myself. Once a kite, hovering over the garden, made a stoop at me, and if I had not resolutely drawn my hanger, and run under a thick espalar, he would have certainly carried me away in his talons. Another time, walking to the top of a fresh molehill, I fell to my neck in the hole, through which that animal had cast up the earth, and coined some lie, not worth remembering, to excuse myself from spoiling my clothes. I likewise broke my right shin against the shell of a snail, which I happened to stumble over, as I was walking alone and thinking on poor England. I cannot tell whether I was more pleased or mortified to observe in these solitary walks that the smaller birds did not appear to be at all afraid of me, but would hop about within a yard's distance, looking for worms and other food, with as much indifference and security as if no creature at all were near them. I remember a thrush had the confidence to snatch out of my hand, with his bill, a bit of cake that Glumdalclitch had just given me for my breakfast. When I attempted to catch any of these birds, they would boldly turn against me, endeavouring to peck my fingers, which I durst not venture within their reach, and then they would hop back unconcerned, to hunt for worms or snails, as they did before. But one day I took a thick cudgel, and threw it with all my strength, so luckily at a linnet, that I knocked him down, and seizing him by the neck with both my hands, ran with him in triumph to my nurse. However, the bird, who had only been stunned, recovering himself, gave me so many boxes with his wings on both sides of my head and body, though I held him at arm's length and was out of reach of his claws, that I was twenty times thinking to let him go. But I was soon relieved by one of our servants, who wrung off the bird's neck, and I had him the next day for dinner by the Queen's command. This linnet, as near as I can remember, seemed to be somewhat larger than an English swan. The maids of honour often invited Glumdalclitch to their apartments, and desired she would bring me along with her, on purpose to have the pleasure of seeing and touching me. They would often strip me naked from toe to toe, and lay me at full length in their bosoms. Wherewith I was much disgusted, because... To say the truth, a very offensive smell came from their skins, which I do not mention or intend to the disadvantage of those excellent ladies, for whom I have all manner of respect. But I conceive that my sense was more acute in proportion to my littleness, and that those illustrious persons were no more disagreeable to their lovers, or to each other, than people of the same quality are with us in England." and after all I found the natural smell was much more supportable than when they used perfumes, under which I immediately swooned away. I cannot forget that an intimate friend of mine in Lilliput took the freedom in a warm day 
when I had used a good deal of exercise, to complain of a strong smell about me, although I am as little faulty that way as most of my sex. But I suppose his faculty of smelling was as nice with regard to me as mine was to that of this people. Upon this point I cannot forbear doing justice to the queen my mistress, and Glumdalclitch my nurse, whose persons were as sweet as those of any lady in England. That which gave me most uneasiness among these maids of honour, when my nurse carried me to visit them, was to see them use me without any manner of ceremony, like a creature who had no sort of consequence. For they would strip themselves to the skin, and put on their smocks in my presence while I was placed on their toilet, directly before their naked bodies, which I am sure to me was very far from being a tempting sight, or from giving me any other emotions than those of horror and disgust. Their skins appeared so coarse and uneven, so variously coloured when I saw them near, with a mole here and there as broad as a trencher, and hairs hanging from it thicker than pack-threads, to say nothing farther concerning the rest of their persons. Neither did they at all scruple, when I was by, to discharge what they had drunk to the quantity of at least two hogsheads, in a vessel that held above three tons. The handsomest among these maids of honour, a pleasant, frolicsome girl of sixteen, would sometimes set me astride one of her nipples with many other tricks, wherein the reader will excuse me for not being over-particular. But I was so much displeased that I entreated Glumdalclitch to contrive some excuse for not seeing that young lady any more. One day a young gentleman, who was nephew to my nurse's governess, came and pressed them both to see an execution. It was of a man who had murdered one of that gentleman's intimate acquaintance. Glumdalclitch was prevailed on to be one of the company, very much against her inclination, for she was naturally tender-hearted. And, as for myself, although I abhorred such kind of spectacles, yet my curiosity tempted me to see something that I thought must be extraordinary. The malefactor was fixed in a chair upon a scaffold, erected for that purpose, and his head was cut off at one blow, with a sword of about forty feet long. The veins and arteries spouted up with such a prodigious quantity of blood, and so high in the air, that the great jet d'eau at Versailles was not equal to it for the time it lasted, and the head, when it fell on the scaffold floor, gave such a bounce as made me start, although I was at least half an English mile distant. The Queen, who often used to hear me talk of my sea voyages, and took all occasions to divert me when I was melancholy, asked me whether I understood how to handle a sail or an oar and whether a little exercise or rowing might not be convenient for my health. I answered that I understood both very well. For although my proper employment had been to be a surgeon or a doctor to the ship, yet often upon a pinch I was forced to work like a common mariner. But I could not see how this could be done in their country, where the smallest wherry was equal to a first-rate man of war among us and such a boat as I could manage would never live in any of their rivers. Her Majesty said, if I would contrive a boat, her own joiner should make it, and she would provide a place for me to sail in. The fellow was an ingenious workman, and by my instructions in ten days finished a pleasure boat with all its tackling, able conveniently to hold eight Europeans. When it was finished, the Queen was so delighted that she ran with it in her lap to the King, who ordered it to be put into a cistern full of water with me in it, by way of a trial, where I could not manage my two skulls or little oars, for want of room. But the Queen had before contrived another project. She ordered the joiner to make a wooden trough of three hundred feet long, fifty broad, and eight deep which, being well pitched to prevent leaking, was placed on the floor along the wall, in the outer room of the palace. It had a cork near the bottom to let out the water when it began to grow stale, and two servants could easily fill it in half an hour. Here I often used to row for my own diversion, as well as that of the Queen and her ladies, who thought themselves well entertained with my skill and agility. 
Sometimes I would put up my sail, and then my business was only to steer, while the ladies gave me a girl with their fans. And when they were weary, some of their pages would blow my sail forward with their breath, while I showed my art by steering starboard or larboard as I pleased. When I had done, Glumdalclitch always carried back my boat into a closet, and hung it on a nail to dry. In this exercise I once met an accident, which would have liked to have cost me my life. For one of the pages, having put my boat into the trow, the governess who attended Glumdalglitch very officiously lifted me up to place me in the boat. But I happened to slip through her fingers, and should have infallibly have fallen down forty feet upon the floor, if, by the luckiest chance in the world, I had not been stopped by a corking pin that stopped in the good woman's stomacher. The head of the pin passing between my shirt and the waistband of my breeches, and thus I was held by the middle in the air till Glumdalclitch ran to my relief. Another time, one of the servants, whose office it was to fill my trowel every third day with fresh water, was so careless as to let a huge frog, not perceiving it, slip out of his pail. The frog lay concealed till I was put into my boat, and then, "'sensing a resting place, climbed up, "'and made it lean so much on one side "'that I was forced to balance it with all my weight on the other, "'to prevent overturning. "'When the frog was got in, "'it hopped at once half the length of my boat, "'and then over my head, backward and forward, "'dubbing my face and clothes with its odious slime. "'The largeness of its features made it appear "'the most deformed animal that can be conceived.' However, I desired Glumdalclitch to let me deal with it alone. I banged it a good while with one of my skulls, and at last forced it to leap out of the boat. But the greatest danger I ever underwent in that kingdom was from a monkey, who belonged to one of the clerks of the kitchen. Glumdalclitch had locked me up in her closet while she went somewhere upon business, or a visit. The weather being very warm, the closet window was left open, as well as the windows and the door of my bigger box, in which I usually lived, because of its largeness and conveniency. As I sat, quietly meditating at my table, I heard something bounce in at the closet window, and skip about from one side to the other. Whereat, although I was very much alarmed, yet I ventured to look out, but not stirring from my seat. And then I saw this frolicsome animal frisking and leaping up and down, "'till at last he came to my box, "'which he seemed to view with great pleasure and curiosity, "'peeping in at the door and every window. "'I retreated to the farther corner of my room, or box. "'But the monkey, looking in at every side, "'put me in such a fright that I wanted presence of mind "'to conceal myself under the bed, "'as I might easily have done. "'After some time spent in peeping, grinning, and chattering, he at last espied me, and reaching one of his paws in at the door, as a cat does when she plays with a mouse, although I often shifted place to avoid him, he at length seized the lappet of my coat, which, being made of that country silk, was very thick and strong, and dragged me out. He took me in his right forefoot, and held me as a nurse as a child she is going to suckle, just as I have seen the same sort of creature do with a kitten in Europe and when I offered to struggle, he squeezed me so hard that I thought it more prudent to submit. I have good reason to believe that he took me for a young of one of his own species, by his often stroking my face very gently with his other paw. In these diversions he was interrupted by a noise at the closet door, as if somebody was opening it, whereupon he suddenly leaped up to the window at which he had come in, and thence upon the leads of the gutter, "'walking upon three legs, "'and holding me in the fourth till he climbed up to a roof "'that was next to ours. "'I heard Glumdalclitch give a shriek "'at the moment he was carrying me out. "'The poor girl was almost distracted. "'That quarter of the palace was all in an uproar. "'The servants ran for ladders. "'The monkey was seen by hundreds in the court "'sitting upon the ridge of a building, "'holding me like a baby in one of his forepaws "'and feeding me with the other.' by cramming into my mouth 
some victuals he had squeezed out of the bag on one side of his chaps, and patting me when I would not eat, whereat many of the rabble below could not forbear laughing. Neither do I think they justly ought to be blamed, for without question the sight was ridiculous enough to everybody but myself. Some of the people threw up stones, hoping to drive the monkey down. But this was strictly forbidden, or else, very probably, my brains had been dashed out. The ladders were now applied and mounted by several men, which, the monkey observing and finding himself almost encompassed, not being able to make enough speed with his three legs, let me drop on a ridge tile and made his escape. Here I sat for some time, five hundred yards from the ground, expecting every moment to be blown down by the wind, or to fall by my own giddiness and come tumbling over and over from the ridge to the eaves. But an honest lad, one of my nurse's footmen, climbed up, and putting me into his breeches pocket, brought me down safe. I was almost choked with the filthy stuff the monkey had crammed down my throat. But my dear little nurse picked it out of my mouth with a small needle, and then I fell a vomiting, which gave me great relief. Yet I was so weak and bruised in the sides with the squeezes given by this odious animal, that I was forced to keep my bed a fortnight. The king, queen, and all the court sent every day to inquire after my health and Her Majesty made me several visits during my sickness. The monkey was killed, and an order made that no such animal should be kept about the palace. When I attended the king after my recovery, to return him thanks for his favours, he was pleased to rally me a good deal upon this adventure. He asked me what my thoughts and speculations were while I lay in the monkey's paw, how I liked the victuals he gave me, his manner of feeding, and whether the fresh air on the roof had sharpened my stomach. He desired to know what I would have done upon such an occasion in my own country. I told His Majesty that in Europe we had no monkeys, except such as were bought for curiosity from other places, and so small that I could deal with a dozen of them together if they presumed to attack me. And as of that monstrous animal with whom I am so lately engaged, it was indeed as large as an elephant, if my fears had suffered me to think so far as to make use of my hanger, looking fiercely and clapping my hand on the hilt as I spoke, when he poked his paw into my chamber, perhaps I should have given him such a wound as would have made him glad to withdraw it with more haste than he put it in. This I delivered in a firm tone, like a person who was jealous lest his courage should be called in question. However, my speech produced nothing else beside a loud laughter which all the respect due to his majesty from those about him could not make them contain. This made me reflect how vain an attempt it is for a man to endeavour to himself honour among those who are out of all degree of equality or comparison with him. And yet I have seen the moral of my behaviour very frequent in England since my return. Were a little contemptible violet, without the least title to birth, person, wit, or common sense, shall presume to look with importance, and put himself upon a foot with the greatest persons of the kingdom. I was every day furnishing the court with some ridiculous story, and Glumdale Clitch, although she loved me to excess, yet was arch enough to inform the queen whenever I committed any folly that she thought would be diverting to her majesty. The girl, who had been out of order, was carried by her governess to take the air about an hour's distance or thirty miles from town. They alighted out of the coach near a small footpath in a field, and Glumdale Clitch, setting down my travelling-box, I went out of it to walk. There was a cow-dung in the path, and I must need try my activity by attempting to leap over it. I took a run, but unfortunately jumped short, and found myself just in the middle up to my knees. I waded through with some difficulty, and one of the footmen wiped me as clean as he could with his handkerchief, for I was filthy beermered, and my nurse confined me to my box till we returned home, where the queen was soon informed of what had passed, and the footman spread it about the court, so that all the mirth for some days was at my expense.' 